Today's question. Why don't pilots have some easy mechanical device like a string with a weight on it or a spirit level in the cockpit to help them orient themselves in case they lose their instrumentation or if they become disoriented? Well, it turns out that there are a few very good reasons for that. And even if you think that you know the answer to this, stay tuned. After the video that I did about China Airlines Flight 006 from Taiwan, to Los Angeles, where the pilots ended up not trusting their instruments and getting into a really bad upset. I got a lot of questions from you guys. And a lot of those questions circled around the fact that shouldn't they just have something like a string hanging from the ceiling with a weight in it or a spirit level, something that you know they knew that they could trust to orient what's up and down and get the aircraft back into level flight again. That's actually a better question than you guys might think because it enables me to explain why it is so important that pilots always trust their instruments and not their equilibrium system, their inner ear and what they feel when they're out flying. So we humans, we were built to do fairly simple things. We were supposed to be running around on the savanna, you know, not being eaten by saber-toothed tigers, uh, maybe hunt some deer, but we tended to be either lying down, sitting up, standing, walking, or running. That doesn't include many forces. Yes, there is a little bit of acceleration there as you might be sprinting away to avoid that saber-toothed tiger, but it's not going to be a huge amount of different type of forces. The major force involved is going to be the gravitational pull, which is always towards the center of the Earth. That changed a lot when we got into aircraft and we started flying. Because once you're in an aircraft, the body will actually be subjected to a lot of different forces. When you are flying in an unaccelerated straight and level flight, if you have a string with a weight on it attached to your cockpit ceiling, that string is going to hang straight down. Perfect. It's going to show you what's up and down. Absolutely. But the problems start already when you initiate your first turn. As you initiate this turn, all of a sudden this aircraft is going to be subjected to both the gravitational acceleration and the centripetal acceleration. That's what you feel when you're on a merry-go-round and you feel like you're being pushed out from the center. But what we want to do as pilots is we want to coordinate the use of aileron and rudder to make the resultant force feel completely perpendicular to the wings feel like you're being pushed straight down. You've noticed this as a passenger. When you've been out flying and you're looking out of the window, you realize that the aircraft is turning. If you look down at your cup of coffee or your glass of water, whatever you might have, you'll see that the surface of the water is not going anywhere. It's not about to spill just because you're banking 30 degrees. And that's because we coordinate the turn. But this also means that the force that is now being subjected onto you, where you're being pushed into your seat slightly, is also going to affect any weight at the end of your string. So as you're increasing the bank angle now to maybe 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, you keep your altitudes, so you keep pulling a little bit on your elevator, you are going to feel more and more g-forces that's gonna push you more and more. You'll feel heavier and heavier in your seat, but it's all straight down. If you're looking out, the aircraft is banking 60 degrees, but your piece of string is still going to be hanging straight down, just like it did when you are in a level, unaccelerated flight. You probably have seen examples of this, these awesome videos here on YouTube where skilled aerobatic pilots are actually pouring themselves a glass of water as they're doing a barrel roll, because in a barrel roll, the way that you're supposed to do it is that the aircraft is going to be subjected to 1G or more throughout the whole maneuver. So you start off with a little bit more G-loading, it's gonna be a little bit less at the top and then it's going to be more again at the bottom of the roll, but it's still gonna be straight down. So in an extreme here, you might be completely upside down, still being able to pour water into a glass, the string is gonna be hanging straight down from your ceiling, but you're upside down. So that string is not showing where the ground is. In fact, it is doing the absolute opposite. And that's what's so important for you guys to understand because that string with a weight on it works exactly the same as your inner ear, your equilibrium system does. So your equilibrium system will tell you that you're fine, you're flying straight ahead, you might be completely upside down, okay? It all has to do with what kind of forces is being subjected to it. But that's just turning, all right? We haven't even started to talk about accelerations, decelerations, and pitch. 
So now let's say that you are in that straight level unaccelerated flight and you decide to pitch up, to start to climb. Initially, as you do so, that string is going to go backwards, okay? Just as you expect, it's gonna start showing that you're pitching up. But what if, as you're now pitching up, the aircraft starts decelerating? It might well do. Well, then the deceleration is gonna have the opposite effect. So that's going to force the pendulum to swing forward again. And you could end up in a situation where you're pitching up and you're decelerating at the rate that keeps that string once again completely straight down. The same goes for when you are pitching up and you're accelerating. And here's actually where it becomes dangerous because there has been a lot of crashes that has been attributed to something called somatographic illusion. And somatographic illusion is exactly what we're talking about, guys. It is you, your inner ear, your equilibrium system being fooled by the combination of pitch and acceleration. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you're in an aircraft and that aircraft is going around. Uh, it's abandoning its approach and it's starting to climb. As you're starting to climb, you will feel that you're being pushed back into the seat. That's the normal pitch back. But you're also adding thrust. You want to start taking up your flaps, cleaning up the aircraft as part of the go around. That acceleration pushes you even further back into the seat. And remember, our inner ear cannot distinguish between an acceleration and the pitch momentum. They feel exactly the same. So if you're not constantly looking at your attitude and seeing how much you're pitching, if you're just going what you're feeling in your head, you're gonna feel both the pitch and the acceleration. The brain is going to interpret that as an extreme pitch up and you might pitch forward in order to stop what you feel is an excessive pitch up. The problem is that as you're now pitching forward, the aircraft will accelerate even further. You'll be pushed more back into the seat the brain once again says, you're pitching up, and you push even further forward. This has led to accidents where pilots have actually pitched their aircraft straight into the ground just because of that feeling in their inner ear that they're actually pitching up too much. So can this be used for something positive then? Yes, it can. In fact, we use some of the gravity illusion in our full flight simulators to train pilots and to simulate things like pitch and acceleration. If we take an example of a takeoff and a rejected takeoff, if you're inside of the simulator, when the takeoff roll begins, they will set takeoff thrust and they will start rolling down the runway. They see just the horizon and the runway and the acceleration. Outside, the simulator will be pitched backwards a little bit, pitched up. And that will give the sensation inside of the cockpit that they are being pushed into the backrests, right? Pushed back, which will further give that feeling of acceleration. If I then give them an engine failure, they will react by rejecting the takeoff. And as they do so, they close the thrust levels, they initiate braking, and if you look at the sim outside, all of a sudden, the simulator pitches violently forward. That will force the pilots in the cockpit to be kind of pushed into their seat belt, giving that feeling of a proper deceleration. And this is what gives fidelity to our full flight simulators. This is what makes them so realistic to use that we can actually use them for things like takeoff and landing training. The fact that everything inside of an aircraft is subjected to all of these forces at once, including that string with the weight on it or the spirit level, and that we humans are so susceptible to villas because of the way that our inner ear and our equilibrium system works, makes it almost impossible for us to orient ourselves once we come into a cloud. Because once we come into a cloud, you won't see or feel anything that's close to reality. In fact, it will only take a couple of seconds to maybe half a minute before we are so disoriented that we will start to spiral out of control. And that has actually been proven by scientific tests in simulators. This is why we spend so much time during our instrument flying to just concentrate on trusting our instrumentation. Because our artificial horizon, that one is built on gyros. In the case of big airlines like the 737, we have laser gyro, but that will do the same thing it will have a reference point that is fixated on a point in space, right? And it doesn't matter what kind of forces is being subjected to that gyro, it will just show the correct orientation once it has been stabilized, which we do on the ground. So as we're turning, rolling, accelerating, that gyro will show where the horizon is all the time. Now, if we would lose that gyro, or if we would lose all three of our uh, artificial horizons, we are still trained to continue to fly, but in that case, we have to continuously scan our magnetic compass 
our indicated airspeed, our IVSI, that's our vertical speed indicator, and our altimeter. And by scanning those, we can get a feeling of if we're starting to turn, then the compass obviously is going to start turning. If we're starting to climb, we're going to see the IVSI going up and the altimeter is going up. And we can do small, nice corrections using only those instrumentation and still keep us in level flight. But this requires a lot of training and it's something that we focus on flying what we call partial panel during our training to be able to use as a redundancy if the primary instrumentation would fail. But we do actually have something that is like a spirit level in the cockpit and that's our slip and skid indicator. The slip and skid indicator is a gently curved little liquid filled tube with a ball inside of it. Now, if we are initiating, let's say, a right-hand turn, okay, and we don't put enough rudder in, then as we're turning right, the ball is going to go towards the right, and then we step on the ball, right? You put rudder in to where the ball is going, and as you're doing so, that little ball is going to go back to the center again. That means that the turn is coordinated. That's how we coordinate the turns, especially when you're starting to fly in smaller aircraft. In the 737, we actually have a yaw damper that takes care of the coordination of the rudder for us. But as you initiate your training, you are going to have to look a lot at that little slip and skid indicator to make sure that you do get that nice and coordinated turn. Now, if you want to check out the video where I explain why pilots don't swap seats just because something breaks on one side of the cockpit, well then check out this video up here. If you want to support the channel, then get yourself some mentor merch. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.